Today we're able to stand here and claim that through Jesus Christ alone is salvation made possible. We know that the scripture in, instructs us that there's no other way under heaven given to us whereby we must be saved except at the name of Jesus. So my hope and my prayer is that you know Jesus and if you don't know Jesus, I, I hope and pray that he speaks to your heart this morning. He calls you to acknowledge your sins and to repent of those sins that you might be saved and that your name might be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So that one of these days when He does come back, whether it's today or tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, next decade, uh, next century, I probably won't be here. I'll already be in His presence. But you're ready to meet Him. Title of the message this morning is From Death to Life. The Bible tells us in Romans in chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come, fallen short of the glory of God, or come short of the glory of God, as some translations put it. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we understand what wages are, wages are something that we, that we earn. Wages are something that we work towards, we work for. In light of the gospel, we don't work towards or for salvation. We work towards and because of salvation. We understand, according to the scriptures, that if we live in this life apart from Christ alone, that ultimately we will suffer the penalty for our sins, the payment for our sins. You see, while we are dead in sin... Christ calls us to be dead to sin. He calls us out of death and calls us into everlasting life. In light of that story, as we look at the, continue to look at the miracles of Mark, in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, we find, we find two miracles. One is sandwiched between another introduction into the, the next miracle. But we're going to look at, on either side of that one that's sandwiched, and we're going to look at the young lady by the name of Jairus' daughter. Now, wouldn't it be nice uh, if, if people knew who her, what her name was? We don't know her name. We simply know that she was roughly around 12 years old. We know that she was very young. We know that she was the only daughter of Jairus. We know that Jairus was ruler of the synagogue. Now, <clears throat> what it means to be ruler of the synagogue, it simply means that Jairus was an attendant in the synagogue, he was not the high priest. Rather, he was the one who assisted the high priest in coming uh, before and uh, bringing or reading the word. Uh, he would bring out uh, all of those things that were necessary for the high priest to carry out the daily routine or the routine in the local synagogue. We're going to begin reading in Mark in chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1. 21 through 24, and then as I said, there's another miracle sandwiched in between, but we're going to skip on down to verse 35 and read through verse 43. So beginning in verse 21, it says, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she may live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Now I want to skip down to verse 35. It says, While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any, more, any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he came into the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. 
And they laughed him to scorn, but when he had put them all out, he taken the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, <coughs> Excuse me. Talitha Kuma, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Let's bow our heads once again in the word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you and only you are able to bring us from the point of death to life. Lord, that you can save us from the penalty of our sins, which is judgment and eternal separation. And Lord, you can bring us into the glory, glorious light through your gospel and into your presence. Lord, we pray today that as we study your word, Lord, let your word speak to us. We pray your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. There are several points that I want to make this morning. I've got exactly five points. Now, you know, normally Baptist preachers were three strikes and you're out. But this morning, we're going to go a little long, okay? Don't look surprised. We're not going to go long. We'll be out by 2 o'clock. First thing I want you to see, the Word paints a picture of a very desperate Man, Look with me back in verse 23 of chapter 5. It says, And besought him greatly, this is speaking of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed and she may live. Now, there have been many people throughout history who have lost children. And perhaps at some point in their life, they've been very, very desperate for God to intervene on behalf of that little child. Here it is, this man, he's come and he's stepped out in faith. Let's give him credit. He has, he has particularly sought Jesus out. We know that the Gospel of Matthew says that she was dead already. But this, in the Gospel of Mark and both the Gospel of Luke, they say that she is dying. That she is dying. But here it is, this man has sought Jesus out, not necessarily for his, own, for his own pleasure, but for the goodwill of his daughter, who perhaps is either dead or she's lying sick in the bed. Now, according to the Gospel of Mark, we know that he receives a message that she's already died, not to bother the master any longer. You see, Jairus had more faith than the servant had. He was a desperate father looking at a desperate cause he wasn't looking necessarily in despair, but he looked towards Jesus for hope. He looked to Jesus for hope. Because you see, to him, it was his daughter. You know, there's, some people will tell you that there's a special bond between the, the, the daddy and the little girl. But here it is, this man has come to Jesus because his daughter... He's lying sick. Not only was it his daughter, but it was his young daughter. The scripture tells us she, she was at the age of 12 years old. How many 12-year-olds do we have in here this morning? How many 11-year-olds? 10-year-olds? 9-year-olds? Can you just imagine? Can you just imagine having a child that, that young lying at the point of death No. Not only was she his daughter, his young daughter, but she was his only daughter. If you look at the other Gospels, one of the Gospels in particular, Luke in chapter 8 and verse 42 puts it this way. For he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. His only, his only daughter. We don't know if this man had other children or not, but what we do know is that he had only one daughter lying at the brink of death. 
He was a very desperate, desperate man. Secondly, we find a group of mourners. We find a group of mourners. Many have pointed the fact that many of these mourners perhaps were hired mourners. You see, in, in those days, it was very customary because they didn't have telephone, they didn't have internet, they didn't have, they didn't have a way to communicate to family, to extended family members who, who had moved out of the area. And so it was very customary for those people in those days when they had suffered a loss in their family to go out into the community, the local community, and to bring in these women who, who, would, uh, who would mourn on behalf of the family, mourn for the loss of this one in the community. Not only that, that they would also hire, uh, they would also hire musicians to come and to play, perhaps softly in the background. But we know that according to the story, we know that these people, they were weeping and they were wailing and, and they were loud. Not only were they paid, but they were loud. Mark tells us when Jesus entered into the house, he heard all the tumult, the King James Version puts it. He heard all the noise. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 23 says this, And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, not only perhaps were they paid, not only were they loud, but they were ridiculed. When, when Jesus entered into the house, he told them, he said, she's not dead, she's simply sleeping. Now these people being paid mourners, paid mourners, they were, they were probably experts in the field of death. This probably wasn't their first rodeo. They knew what dead looked like and she was dead by all their accounts. And so when Jesus told them, listen, she's not dead, she's simply sleeping. To the gospel say that, she, that they scorned Jesus. Another translation puts it this way, this way, that they ridiculed Jesus. Can you imagine? Here it is, they're weeping and wailing about this poor little girl, an only daughter, 12 years old, who has died. And Jesus said, What's all the hubbub, bub? She's not dead. She's simply sleeping. And they go from weeping and mourning and crying to laughing. Listen. Listen, you Jesus. Some say you're a prophet. I'm a professional in death. I know what dead looks like and she's dead. If you'll notice in the background on the screen, When someone passes away, it's customary to take the linen and cover their face. Verse 40 says, and they laughed him to scorn. What did Jesus do? out of the room. He kicked him out of the room. And he called on a few good men. Now Luke tells us that those few good men were Peter, James, and John. Along with the young, young lady's parents. Her father and her mother. Isn't it amazing that when you think of Peter, James, and John, you know, I often think of the, the little song that we used to learn in vacation Bible school. Peter, James, and John had a little sailboat. Peter, James, and John had a little sailboat. Peter, James, and John had a little sailboat. What's the last? Next. Okay. <laughs> it also comes to mind when we think of Peter, James, and John, they would be the only three that Jesus would invite to the Mount of Transfiguration when both Elijah and Moses would appear. It would be Peter who would be, want to build an altar to all three. The inner circle. 
John referred himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Peter, of course, old hot headed Peter. James would later become one of the leaders in the church. This is not James, the brother of Jesus. This is James, the apostle. Jesus would invite these three men of whom he trusted the most, of whom he had kinship with the most, into the most intimate settings. Perhaps, and this is kind of my take on it, perhaps Jesus wanted them to see firsthand the transformation from death to life. Perhaps he wanted them to understand truly what faith in action was all about. You see, Jairus, the father, the ruler of the synagogue, the father of the young little girl, had come to Jesus in faith. He even makes a statement to Jesus. If you'll just come and touch her, she'll be made to live. Perhaps Jesus wanted to see, wanted Peter, James, and John to see what faith could do, that it in fact could remove mountains. That he could pluck up trees. That it could cause the lame to walk and the blind to see and the dead to live. And obviously we cannot, we cannot, we cannot overlook the fact That being brought from death to life required the presence of Jesus. The writer of Acts tells us that there's none other name under heaven, on earth, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus and you alone. Fourthly, there was a desperate man, a group of mourners, a few good men who would see a striking miracle. You see, when Jesus arrived, on all accounts, this young, young lady was dead. Death had entered into the home where once the sound of laughter and joy. South Arkansas, we call that carousing. Kids play. Perhaps the singing. Striking miracle is about to take place. Look with me in verse 41 and 42. Mark in chapter 5. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Palitha Kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was at the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. You see in this poor little body, laid out, perhaps covered up, with all the tumult or commotion taking place, after Jesus had kicked all the ridiculers out, this body began to breathe. Those little eyes began to blink. We don't know how long this stanza had been deceased according to all accounts but that blood began to flow and that body began to warm simply at Jesus speaking think about this for a moment Though we are dead in sin, He became sin for us. 
that we through his death and burial and resurrection might be saved from sin and have life. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly. The fullness of life, some might say. So he takes this little girl by the hand. King James Heard says, he speaks to her and says, Arise. Arise. Death had been overcome and life had been given. We see immediately. And I'm like, you know, it never ceases to amaze me at the word immediately. The King James Version in verse 42 says, and straightway. Another, another one of the Gospels says, and immediately. There was no delay. It happened right then, there, and now. And immediately, she rose. Immediately, when Jesus spoke, life was restored. Sharing with a young man just this last week, he was explaining to me why, you know, why he hadn't been baptized yet. Because he, you know, he, he smoked. And he didn't want to smoke. But as soon as he quit smoking, he was going to get baptized. And I told him, I said, let me tell you something, friend. If you wait until you get it all together, you'll never be saved and baptized. And I said, there's something that precedes baptism, and that's salvation. And it's not upon any count of our own, but it's upon what Jesus did on our behalf. You see, only Jesus can bring one from death to life. A striking miracle that takes place it strikes at the very heart of the matter, sin, which causes death. And immediately, <laughs> immediately, Jesus saves. It's not a progress. It's not progress that we make. It's not a process we go through. It's an immediate change that takes place in the life of a believer. Someone who's professed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lastly, we find a resurrected man. I want you to notice this. Verse 42 and 43. We're going to read verse 42 again. It says, And straightway, or immediately, the damsel arose and walked. For she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Now, what's amazing is that when you look back to verse 21, Jesus simply tells her, it's interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Get up. Don't lay there any longer. This young lady, if she's like most of society today, she could have laid there kicking and screaming and said, I don't want to get up. I'm not going to get up. I'm strictly comfortable. You see, in society today, when you proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and the work on, that he performed on the cross on our behalf, there are many today who continue to reject the fact that Jesus is the only way to salvation. They'll say, I'm not going to be saved. Don't want to be saved. I am perfectly comfortable where I'm at. And then on the other hand, you'll have many of people who will respond in this way. Well, you know what? When I'm ready to get saved, I'm going to get everything right and I'm going to be saved. But I want you to notice about this young lady. 
when Jesus spoke and told her, Arise. What did she do? Mark says, King James Version, straight away. Another gospel says, immediately. There was no hesitation. The young lady didn't look up at Jesus and say, Just a minute, let me catch my breath. She didn't look up to Jesus and make all kinds of excuses and say, Listen, I was dead. Give me time to gain my strength back. Let me fix my face first. Because you know all those mourners that were here out here that you picked out? You know, when I walk out of this room, they're going to look at me and they're going to say, Boy, I would have thought she'd have done more with herself. I would have thought she'd have gotten dressed up. What kind of girl is that that doesn't make herself presentable to present to the public? No, she didn't make those excuses. But she was obedient to the command of Jesus. You see, many people choose to continue a life of death because they don't want to be obedient to anyone. Also, I want you to notice this. I'll get you right button here in a minute. This young lady, when she, when she got up, evidently Jesus knew she was hungry. We don't know how long she'd been dead, but evidently she hadn't eaten in quite a while. One of the first things that Jesus did was to inform her parents, get that girl something to eat. Let me tell you spiritually what that says. Jesus wanted them to understand that in fact, this young lady who had, been, who had ceased to breathe, her heart had ceased to beat, who had been laying there, covered up, given up for all counts as dead, now she had a physical need, and that physical need was something to sustain the life that Jesus had given her back. In other words, he wanted to prove to them that this was not some spiritual apparition, this is not her spirit that's just been, been exhumed from her body and just floating around in the air. No, no. Jesus wanted to point out to them that in fact, she was alive. In fact, all of those things that she had that she needed before death, she would continue to need after Jesus had restored her life. Perhaps he wanted to show the parents much in the same way that he did to old doubting Thomas. Here, Thomas, see my hands, feel my scars. Here, Thomas, thrust your hand into my side, Thomas. Perhaps he didn't want the parents to think that she was no longer human, but now she had become God and she needed and deserved to be worshipped. What Jesus wanted them to understand <clears throat> was the same thing when the Pharisees asked the blind man, in the ninth chapter of John, in verse 24, it says, Then again they call, called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Speaking of Jesus. The man's response was this, verse 25. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, but now... I see. This young lady could now proclaim, so could her parents. My daughter, my only daughter, my young little daughter, who was dead, is now made alive. Amen. One thing before I close. When Jairus came before the presence of Jesus,
He didn't attempt to use his clout, his ego, his identity. It says he came and fell at the feet of Jesus. Another one of the Gospels says that he came and fell and worshipped him. Why was that? Because he knew. I believe this all my heart. Because he understood that only Jesus could restore life to where death was. Only Jesus. He said, if you'll just come and touch her, she will be made alive again. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Has he brought you, not from the brink of death, when we speak of the brink of death, we think that we're teetering on the edge. We're neither dead nor we're alive, but we're just teetering back and forth. No. We're dead. <laughs> we're dead. Apart from Christ, we're dead in sin. And only Jesus can give us life. Only Jesus can forgive us of our sins. Only Jesus can give us an abundant life, a full life, a complete life, an eternal life. Peter, James, and John got to see it. Mom and Daddy got to see it. The little girl got to experience it. And immediately, there was a change. you're here today and you're dead in sin, that is you're not a Christian. <laughs> Many people claim to be a Christian in America, but they don't know Christ. You, can't know, you cannot know Christ and be a Christian at the same time. <coughs> Maybe you're here this morning, God's calling you. He's calling you to confess your sins before him and to repent and to be saved. Christian friend, you know what we often forget? What the power of God through Jesus Christ can do. We read about it in the scriptures. We talk about it in Sunday school. We preach about it from the pulpit. But when was the last time that we immediately took action in our life? That we had faith in God that would remove mountains and pluck up trees? When was the last time in our life when we shared the gospel that, that says only Jesus can save and he's willing. <clears throat> Jesus' inner circle on that very day experienced life change that would forever change their lives. They would boldly declare the, God, declare the gospel till death. With the exception of John. John would spend his last years in exile. Separated from everyone and everything they ever knew. All for the cause of Christ. He would give us the book of Revelation. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. To record those future events many of which are horrific, unspeakable and unimaginable, but also to point to the glory of God in the presence of the saints in eternity with Him. We serve an awesome God. I use that word serving very lightly. When was the last time you served him? Completely. Let's stand together this morning. As our music team comes.
Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. This is able to make, bring one back from the point of death and, Lord, to grant them eternal life. Lord, to prepare them for a heavenly home and to prepare a home for them. To remove their citizenship from this world and the prince of this world and move it to glory. Lord, we pray simply your will be done. Speak to our hearts. Draw us closer to you. If there's anyone lost, draw them to you that they might be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.